Okay, anti-analysis. But if we already looked at unpackers and packers, isn't that an anti-analysis technique? Yes. Yes, it is. What the packers prevent is static analysis. Uh, or or can, can mess you up for static analysis. Um, they don't typically prevent you from from running the thing though in like a sandbox and you know getting information that way. Um, whereas an, anti specific anti analysis techniques really anti um, anti running anti debugging anti VM anti sandbox uh, are more towards the prevention of the, the dynamic analysis. And when you get a packer that does some of the, the anti-debug and anti-VM stuff is, is when you get the, the really uh, um, the more difficult things um, because you not only have to do the um, debugging to get it unpacked, you also have to work with your debugger to get around all of the anti-debugging techniques they're using. Um, so what we're going to go over here is examples of some of the anti-debug, anti-VM techniques so that you will know how to recognize them when you're doing your analysis. Uh, the first one is the is debug flag. That is something that Windows will actually set in memory for each process in or as a way to tell that process that it's being debugged. Um, for example, when it is um, being debugged, maybe it'll output debugging messages. Yeah, so it, it is for helpful purposes originally, but it's also a way that malware authors can check to see if they're being debugged. And if so, then do something else. Maybe, you know, just Exit the process. That's that's the nicest thing that they could do um, right away. Um, and this is typically what you see. Um, so this here, we'll we'll see more of this later. But this accessing of of fs colon something um, that is is typically accessing um, something in the set process environment block. Yes, the process environment block that has a, a bunch of information about the process, including at, um, so fs30, and then you do re reference to, off, add an offset of two into that. So the, the I guess, third byte into that. Um, and that is where the is debug flag is. So if you see this, it's actually showing for is debug. Um, there's also a function in kernel 32 called the TSD debugger present that they could could call. Um, that's pretty easy to spot because you'll see like the string in there. Um, unless they're doing some kind of string obfuscation, then you get around the string obfuscation. You can you can see it, um, or it'll be in the in the imports. Uh, that's that's really nice. Uh, NT query information process. Um, process information class. Um, this is just another way of, of getting that process information. So just to be aware that when you see see these things here, um, it means, well, this is specifically checking it is debugging, and this is checking for it, and then this could be uh, checking for it. It just means it's getting process information. Um, there are some tools that have been developed or, or plugins that have been developed to help with the uh, analyzing for the paid version. Uh, there's the iStealth plugin. Um, pretty sure that's yeah. I'm pretty sure that's not for the version of Ida that we have. Um, but you can use that if you do, and if you like to do some of your debugging within Ida. Um, as I said, I like to use Ollie Debug, and it has a plugin called Ollie Advanced that has uh, several features that I'll, I'll show you to, uh, to get around. Basically, unsetting that flag in memory so that this check 
um, or this check does not uh, succeed. Or we're pretty much live. Um, yeah. Also, timing checks, get tick count, query performance counter, our, our API calls. RDTSC is an actual assembly instruction that you would see. Um, oh, yeah, hey, here, look at this. Um, you'd call it, um, get the, the result in EAX, do something, and then call it again, and compare, see how much time elapsed. And if a um, lot of time elapsed between the two, more than one would expect if it's running through and not being debugged, then that's also a, a way that malware authors will check to see if they're um, being analyzed, because analyzing it can slow down the code learning. And can that also be just an artifact of being uh, preemptive? It depends on the... Or is, are the it's not going to count? It's certainly, it's certainly a, it's a heuristic. Okay. So they have to decide, an all author has to decide, what is my threshold? So, so if you talk about interrupts and in processes, you're talking about somewhere between one to three, maybe five times. You know, that takes a run. Correct that you are talking about where it's magnitude longer. Okay. Right. So thank you. And what so what you'll see sometimes here is a single instruction. And it just it wants to see how much time it took to run that thing like that start instruction, which should be, you know, sub second. And if it's more than that, then it goes, eh, I don't think so. Um, there's, a, there's a script here that I, I, I don't want to take credit for this. This is all Matt on this one. Um, he made this. Oh, that's, that's not very pretty. Um, where if you, you run this script, then wherever your cursor is, it, it takes a look at that segment, grabs the start and the end of that segment, and pretty much it goes through, and if it's uh, SIDT, SDT, basic VM detection stuff, it'll color it orange. And if it's uh, RGTSC, then it'll, it'll color it blue. And if it's accessing the PEV, that FS colon, then it'll color it purple. And just as an additional way of, of visually as you're analyzing the code, for those particular instructions to stick out. And this, this can be useful if you expect uh, there to be one of these things going on. Um, structured exception handling. This would be like with legit code, your um, try accept stuff. Um, but something that malware will do is it'll set up a exception handler, and then intentionally cause an exception, like a divide by zero, or a, you know, move something into memory position zero, which is going to cause an exception, memory access exception, which will make their exception handler get called, and just as a way to um, um, execute code in a fashion that it's, it's not as easy to see that that's going to happen. But if you see a accessing of that FS0, especially a moving into that, that's a exception handler being set up. Um, and as I said, with, uh, with Ollie, I'll show you how we can uh, um, get, get around, or basically, instead of the debugger catching those exceptions, pass it off to the process so that it doesn't know that, that you're actually debugging it. Um, Anti-dump, this is something that I run into where, so for Ollie dump, Ollie dump needs to read the PE headers from the original file. So what the process will do is while it is, um, uh, while it is running, it will actually um, open, and gotta love this with Windows, how do you open a file? Call create file. Um, and with the, the share mode of zero, meaning um, I want exclusive access, I don't want anybody else to be able to read this file while I have it open. 
uh, thing. And then uh, if, if it does that, like if a packer does that, then um, Ollie will report back, hey, I can't open the, the source file, and it'll have, have trouble dumping it out to the disk. And the anti-VM stuff, the classic red pill uses SIDT. There are other um, ones that the, that's an actual um, assembly instruction, as I showed in the what was that here? In the coloring script, there's there's other instructions like that. Um, one thing with this is that since the move to multi-core processors, this has become less useful because each core will actually have report something different. Um, so I'm, I would say that I don't see this a lot myself, but it's still good to, to know about. Um, there are, of course, other ways of detecting VMware. There's, the, there's an I.O. port. Um, that uh, they could check. There's also just checking the presence for VMware tools in the process list or checking for program files slash VMware tools. Uh, no, don't, don't neglect the simple stuff. So with all of these that we showed, if you guys take a look at